And so how many amino acids do they think life started with or Luca had or how, which approach did they take there? Right. And they were mainly focusing on sort of the later ordering, but the general sense is that there was probably nine or 10 amino acids that were the original amino acids in uh, the, the earliest genetic code. And I can't recall exactly what they said were, were the very, very earliest. That wasn't their focus, but generally the sense is it's about 10 or so that were the earliest. Okay. And Maybe is a there, few more. are there organisms today that use only nine or 10 amino acids? Is that I haven't specifically researched that, but what you generally find today is that organisms today generally will have a large number, uh, percentage of the amino acids today are used in their various proteins. Some use all 20, mm -hmm. some may not use all 20, but there's, there's going to be a, a, a wide variety of the amino acids used today, which would be more than what they would have expected from the early earth. But I can't remember the exact details of what that looks like today. That's part okay. of the research we'll do later. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, that'd be interesting to know if there's any living organism that can get away with just nine or 10 amino yeah, acids. Yeah. I don't think they have much like that. They haven't had much success unless it's a super simple thing like sticking to something. Well, okay. But that's not a living organism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So they've, they've decided that there's based on their statistical research there, they're proposing a slightly different ordering of the amino acids being recruited. We'll use that term into the genetic code over time. And, what what's your thinking here in terms of is, is the statistics fine is the approach that they took to this fine where, where does it kind of go off the rails if it does in your opinion right and again this is really just it's kind of just circular reasoning like if okay. you take some set of i mean and i love the titles like the titles like I, I mean, I, it, the title is basically like, we've solved this, this shows this. It's, it's a very, you know, yeah, it's a very it's been resolved, it says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite a statement. And, uh, and I guess that's what's helpful to get papers published. But yeah. the reality is it's all circular reasoning. They just reconstructed from the sequences today with some proteins. And then they saw that certain amino acids were, were less common. And they just said, well, that's probably suggests this is when they're recruited. But, but there's a huge problem with this is that, they're not exactly examining some of the essential proteins in life, like th something like a topoisomerase, which- yeah, tell, us, tell us about topoisomerase. Topoisomerase is a remarkable enzyme. In fact, there's a video online with their Discovery YouTube channel that shows this, this enzyme. And what topoisomerase is necessary for is untangling knots in DNA. And, and it's really remarkable that people like Francis Crick recognized really early that this thing would be necessary Mm. even before it was discovered. But what happens with DNA is you've got two separate strands. They have to be opened up and that allows for the information to be accessed. But when you open up these strands, it the DNA starts to twist. Like yeah. for those of us that remember telephone cords back in the day or something like that, yep, yep. they would twist in this very inconvenient pattern. So what happens is as that twisting or super, super coiling takes place, you can no longer open the DNA to gain the information. So you have to have, in a DNA uh, translation system, you've got to have a, a machine, a molecular machine, that will essentially snip the DNA into, pass part of it through the broken piece, and then reassemble the DNA. It's called topoisomerase. It's, it's incredibly yeah, sophisticated. Yeah. So that video is great. I would certainly encourage everybody to check that out. Our colleague, uh, Joe DeWeese, has done a lot of work on topoisomerase. But that's, you know, it's an interesting, let me pause here for a second, Brian, because this is an interesting situation where one solution to an engineering problem creates another. So if you're trying to untwist DNA, you need DNA helicase, right? Which is running mm -hmm. along, uh, unzipping the DNA. Yeah, to unzip it. And then because of that, you end up with supercoiling in the DNA, which can also prevent, do two things, I guess, prevent it from being accessed and also potentially break, cause breakages within the DNA strand. And so now you need another system, which is called topoisomerase, to come along and resolve the supercoiling. So, yeah, it's sort of this cascade of engineering problems as you start to go down the track of figuring out how you're going to actually translate this and build these amino acids that we've been talking about. Okay, so that's all. All right, so sorry to sorry to sidetrack you there, but but uh, you were mentioning topoisomerase and other machines that are required to do this translation and and trans uh, tra transcription and translation process. Yeah, and then another machine is like what's called the polymerase, and what that'll do is mm -hmm. that will go along your. You have different types. One will let's say with with DNA will copy one strand of DNA, 
So that's in cell division. Before a cell can break into two cells and divide, yep. you have to copy the DNA. And you need a very complicated machine that does that. And then, of course, if you want to make proteins, you've got to have, uh, you have to have a polymerase that will take your um, DNA and turn it into the mRNA or into sort of the message right. protein that goes to your ribosome. And again, these particular machines have to have the amino acids that are some of the most complicated. So in other words, before you can evolve a genetic code, before you can change a genetic code, before you can even have a genetic code, you've got to have complex machines which require the amino acids that are believed to have occurred long after the code was in existence. Mm -hmm. This -hmm. is the problem. Yeah. And are you seeing people address that or they're just kind of leaving that for future, you know, we'll deal with that problem later? Well, there's people that acknowledge that this is a challenge. Uh, Mm -hmm. They say, yeah, this is an unresolved problem, but usually it's an unresolved problem. What they'll say is, well, yeah, today, maybe topar isomerase and polymerase, they require these very advanced amino acids. But maybe back in the day, when you have your original genetic code, maybe the topoisomerase-like protein didn't have the more complicated amino yeah. acids. That's sort of the logic. Yeah, but there's so an must, enormous... What's that? Must be a simpler way that it was done in the past, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's, again, circular reasoning. The problem is, from a purely engineering perspective, to do what you need to do with these machines to actually identify the, amino, the, the nucleotides, to break DNA, to do a lot of these various tasks, even to have the structural stability you absolutely must have more complicated amino acids. A simple amino acid simply can't do what you need to do. And this is the huge problem. Okay, so let me see if I can restate the circular reasoning piece here then. So if you take an engineering approach and you look at this system and you say, what is required to do these various functions, you end up somewhere similar to what we have today, what we see in living organisms, you know, the... the simplest living organism, if you want to even use that term, you know, let's say a single celled organism, you need something along those lines. Okay. But here's where the circular reasoning comes into place because we start with the recognition that I think everybody has that, well, it couldn't have started this complex because that doesn't work for evolutionary theory. So it must have started more simply. And therefore we're just going to assume that there were these hypothetical I could say made up, but I know you're a nice guy, Brian. So we'll just say hypothetical uh, organism, hypothetical uh, genetic code, hypothetical copying process, hypothetical replication process must have existed because that's what our theory says. And so therefore, we're going to then use those assumptions to try to then flesh out the theory. But we're, we're falling back on the circularity because we've, we've assumed the very thing that is in question here. 